Uh, I'm George Mitchell. I have 20 plus years of experience as application developer, software infrastructure engineer, enterprise architect. I co-founded the API program at Discover Financial Services a few years ago. And um, I have been focused on the API space for the past three years. And I'm currently the leading uh, the, leading the the API Center for Enablement for for Discover. Uh, so, if you're not familiar with Discover Financial Services, uh, to give you a sense of how complex of an environment we are dealing with, at Discover we have our own proprietary global payment network. Uh, Discover is the third largest payment network after Visa and Mastercard, moving hundreds of billions of dollars daily. Uh, in the US and around the world. Um, Discover is also a digital bank with billions of dollars in deposits and millions of customers. We are based in Chicago, but uh, we have about 17,000 employees around the world. So it, it is a kind of complex, highly secure, highly regulated uh, enterprise. Uh, once in a while, I do post on LinkedIn. So here's my LinkedIn profile. would love to connect and to continue the conversation there if you would like. With that, you know what to Daniel. Okay, hey, so uh, this is this is Daniel, Daniel Izquierdo. So I'm um, the CEO of Viteria. I'm a president at Dinner Source Commons and I'm part of the governing board of Chaos that stands for Community Health Analytics for Open Source Software. It's a Linux Foundation project for um, you know, understanding the health of uh, software development projects. Um, yeah, moving forward. So, uh, well, first of all, thank you all for your your time today. Uh, this is a mainly a an open uh, call for for discussion on APIs and an inner source. We are going to bring our own angles. Um, if we move forward with the with the slides, we'll see um, the agenda for for today. Basically, why we are here, you know, some motivation and challenges on on this world. In principles, we'll rediscover them of inner source and APIs experiences, specifically coming from Discover Financial. Um, kind of an open discussion of first question for the, you know, what is a good seed project in, in the inner source uh, space coming from an API context? Big disclaimer here if there is a question on APIs, George is the person to go. I'm not an expert in the field. Uh, I can share my thoughts and own opinions, of course. Um, so moving forward to the next slide, uh, probably the first the first thing I would like to to share with with all of you is we are here because of uh, a lift, an elevator. Um, it's always good to 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 remember that uh, the the power of of connections. So all of this started, and this is kind of an anecdote, uh, when George and I we both met at the API days in New York. Um, it was in an elevator. So basically, literally, we went going to the I think the fifth floor where the conference were, were taking place. We introduced each other, and then we started to discuss. Okay, so what do you do? You know, the, the usual stuff. So I was doing this kind of quick survey through the you know through the API days in in New York. The other people, uh, nothing really fancy or scientific oriented, but basically talk, talking to people and saying, hey. So do you know about inner source, uh, the, the principles, do you know about this is and so on? And I only met two people that knew about the concept of inner source. So first lessons learned is basically we should go to other places to say, okay, this is inner source. And the, um, and the second lesson learned was basically about how can we grow into that space where, you know, other communities and, and, and where inner source might be a, a good benefit for, for other corporations and, and companies. So George was the only one in the whole conference that knew about inner source and was actually applying inner source in their API, you know, internal ecosystem at Discover. So this is the main reason why we are here. So we said we, we have to share this. We need to bring our thoughts on inner source and APIs. And this is uh, this is our day today. Um, so moving forward to the next slide. Um, So, uh, well, George, this is this is yours, but basically uh, just to say that uh, today is, is a lot on having this open discussion. This is this is new for both of us in the sense of, OK, what are the best practices that we can apply from inner source perspective into API world and the other way around? Right. So it's it's about how can we bring both worlds together and please share your thoughts on on, on the chat as well. So, George. 
Yeah, thanks, Daniel. Yeah, it was, it was a great connection back there in, in Itai days in New York. And um, we uh, we became quickly friends on, on our geeky discussion uh, about inner source and, and, and APIs. Um, so just to uh, let the set the stage for those of you who are new to the API domain or the API discipline um, and how API management plays a role in, into the digital transformation and, and in, in the world of software, um, you, you probably came across the statement that software is eating the world, right? Um, okay. In today's digital world, every company is a software company. That's, that's how we could come to understand how software is eating the world. Whether you're in banking industry, insurance industry, telecom, healthcare, even auto industry or, or retail, you are a software company. You're in the software delivery business. But companies are realizing that without APIs, nothing can be done in the digital world. Even in the trending world of artificial intelligence, AI and machine learning, APIs are an essential part of uh, the ecosystem. Companies are realizing that knowing how to develop software is not enough. You must reach certain level of mastery in API management. Uh, they are realizing they, they cannot do anything without APIs. APIs are eating software. Uh, so realizing we're now a software company is not enough. Companies must also realize that they are an API company to be part of the ecosystem outside and inside the organization. Given we're talk we are talking about inner sourcing today and we are looking inwards into our internal teams and internal capabilities, uh, there are APIs at each layer of the internal architecture of uh, the company. Uh, at the data layer, at the process layer, at the experience layer. Uh, at Discover here, we, we have thousands of internal APIs and microservices. Uh, but companies are realizing that the game is no longer just about software development. Uh, it's about connecting and integrating software to compose solution faster, to stitch together the best experience and the best data, data available um, to the business. And APIs are essential parts in order to integrate and to compose solution faster. So, okay, so companies must reach a certain level of mastery in API management. What does mastery look like in an API management program? A good level of mastery, for example, is having an accurate, accurate inventory of all APIs and reusable components easy to find, easy to understand, and easy to access uh, to allow companies to compose solutions faster. Uh, and APIs will also help reach better business alignment. Uh, in fact, we are seeing that APIs are becoming the cornerstone of alignment between business and IT, between different departments, products, and silos. Uh, APIs act as an interface, right? as a contract that clearly advertises the proper capabilities and boundaries across organizations, across teams and products. So with APIs, we don't just develop software, but we develop contracts um, and you create legitimate front doors to your data and processes. Uh, once having that one legitimate front door, you could now close all other back doors. Uh, so you'll be able to apply proper protection of information and assets. With APIs, companies are ultimately uh, enabling their teams to become more product-centric and to have smarter resource allocation to those advertised capabilities and products and services. So as we could see, the software game is changing and part of the game today is to reach certain good level of mastery in API management, which is the most direct precursor to digital transformation. So, Mastery in software development, it's not sufficient. We need mastery in API management. Uh, but API management has many challenges to overcome before you reach that good desired level of mastery. Uh, I would like to share two of those challenges for our discussion today. Um, the first one, uh, the first challenge uh, is API governance. Uh, there are many aspects of API governance we can talk about. Um, and if you're interested, I, I do have a full paper on API governance featured on LinkedIn and on 
discover technology, technology that discover that come, uh, called the fallacies of API governance. There are eight false assumptions when it comes to API governance. But here, let's deal with this one fallacy that uh, first, um, uh, for, uh, false assumption that the standards don't change. In fact, the reality is that yesterday's best practices are today's anti-patterns, right? We need to design API programs and API governance that recognize this reality, the reality of what we call the adoption cycle. When we publish a certain practice today, by the time it starts to get adoption, there comes another better way uh, or a better tool to do the same thing. So we will need to refresh and evolve the way we work uh, without being stuck in outdated practices or outdated ways of working. So you could expect, expect that today's best practice is what we are uh, teaching and, and, and asking uh, the development community to do today. Um, those, those practices are tomorrow's anti-patterns and tomorrow is not really too far out. Um, uh, tools and best practices and, and conventions are, are changing at, at, at very high pace. This fast-paced change is becoming the new norm in today's world. So we need to design governance programs that deal with this reality, this mismatch of speeds in adoption cycle. Um, and that's where uh, I believe principles and lessons from the inner source might come to help. There are so many other fallacies uh, that inner source can help with. Uh, for example, uh, if you're running a center of excellence for your API governance function, uh, one can falsely assume that a knowledge of one small group is reliable, uh, but the reality is that the knowledge can be obsolete very fast. If, if other teams are not sharing their knowledge and if you are not taking their contributions into effect, it will be hard to scale and to evolve fast. Another false assumption is assuming that latency is zero, not accounting for the delay that may be caused by governance and the increasing governance requirements, uh, or assuming that the team's bandwidth is infinite, uh, or the cost of governing everything is zero. Or for example, the assumption that there is only one technology stack, ignoring the need to support multiple platforms multiple languages and, and multiple technology stacks. So we have a use case about that in a share later on uh, today. Um, so there, there are very good lessons to be learned from, in, uh, from the inner source community and to address these challenges of API governance and to tackle the reality of these false assumptions. An important note, just a side note to highlight, I think it's important to highlight that uh, Open source does not mean, or inner source does not mean no governance. I remember my first reaction a while back when I heard about community-based governance model. Um, I was really skeptic until I started to understand and learn more and more uh, the inner source model uh, and the built-in accountability that is part of the model. And there, there are very relevant lessons to be learned uh, from the inner source practices and principles uh, to address these challenges uh, of API governance. Uh, Daniel will talk about uh, those principles and I will, I'll share some use cases where those principles have helped us um, uh, later on the call. First, let's just do the second challenge uh, for, for API that you wanna share today is the API reviews and product enablement. Uh, nowadays, uh, we see everywhere that organizations are moving from being pro project centric to the product center. Uh, not only that, but th there's also the notion of platform engineering uh, to build a platform, technical platform or business platform. Uh, so there's this move from project to product and from product to platform. APIs play a, a, a cru crucial role in the product and platform enablement. Uh, however, if we think about um, one of the product-centric principles, an important principle is autonomy, to have small autonomous teams, you know, the, the two pizza-sized team, or, you know, you hear a lot of all those like autonomous small teams. Uh, autonomy is highly desired in a product team, right? Um, 
you have a product owner or a product manager would really want to eliminate dependencies. Uh, being autonomous is sort of controlling your own destiny. Uh, for teams who strive to be autonomous and with agile, the new speed of agile, uh, agile way of working, they want to eliminate dependencies as much as they can. Uh, they are taught to or trained to be very careful uh, with dependencies, to handle dependencies as a loaded gun or as a timing bomb that could go off at any time. So products want to reduce or to eliminate dependencies as much as possible. On the other hand, we encourage reuse, uh, but reuse will introduce added dependencies. So teams will tell you uh, usually that I'd rather build it myself and be in control rather than having another dependency to manage or another backlog to prioritize with other teams. So this appears to be uh, two conflicting principles at work. Um, and this calls for a shift in, in the culture, in the reuse culture. Now let, let's define that shift in, uh, in culture or in, in the mindset of API reuse versus autonomy. First of all, we do not see reuse and autonomy at a tug of a war conflict. We see them working together in two dimensions. Um, what organizations uh, need is both high API reuse as well as high autonomy. Uh, let's call this, this quadrant uh, becoming a platform uh, where effortless reuse uh, and inner sourcing can help uh, with the, uh, residing in that kind of quadrant to the top right. Um, but if reuse is hard, reuse is avoided, right? So you end up at the lower bottom of, of, of the the bottom two quadrants, right? Uh, you end up in that lower right quadrant if uh, you have high autonomy and low reuse. Uh, in, in, in this uh, quadrant, teams are highly autonomous, but doing whatever they want and causing many silos in the organization. This approach leads to duplicate capabilities, uh, data inconsistencies, and uh, poor customer experience, ultimately. Um, the bottom left quadrant is low reuse and low autonomy. It's 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 very expensive way to run the, in that quadrant. Um, but on the top left, this is where many of, of, of teams are, uh, where there is high reuse uh, happening, but still low autonomy. Uh, here, the company is realizing good savings by reusing APIs, combining and recombining functionalities and data to build new experiences based on some low level APIs. Uh, was virtually no cost or overhead to redo the same capability again. But this reuse model will hit many prioritization issues um, uh, if you want to introduce any changes to those low-level uh, APIs or new features or new APIs. Uh, this reuse model is high friction and not scalable. So in order for an API reuse model to be successful, API reuse must be effortless, uh, avoiding the pain. Not try to avoid the pain. And uh, teams must be able to maintain autonomy at the same time. Uh, so as we're shifting from project to become product-centric organization, there is another transformation needed, uh, uh, a reuse culture to think and to behave as one platform, standardizing across uh, the different teams on how they interact, uh, the culture of collaboration, of communication and transparency to have a skin in the game and be able to predict my own time to market. Uh, so with this, I will turn it over to Daniel to, to walk us through how inner source principle can help with this type of, of, of a cultural change. Daniel. Yeah, and, and this is this is this is probably you've been using consistently words or concepts that we we use it in at the inner source commons and in an inner source space, we can say. So it's basically the first question, you know, high reuse. Uh, and so on is why can my feature be prioritized, right? So then why 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 we are producing once and again similar pieces of code, which is basically in both cases a waste of energy and and you know a, a great path for frustration and, and all of this that happens. So if, if the, the next slide basically is a picture of one of many 
of uh, those beautiful silos that we, you know, we we expose at the inner source commons once and again. And this is this is a metaphor for how organizations work, right? So then each of these silos are the knowledge containers where uh, a group of developers are producing high quality code, but then it happens that this is produced once and again all across the organization. So is there a way we can break down all of these silos? So then this is when we start about the discussion of, of inner source. Bringing a bit more of context to the API discussion and not not being an expert or anything here, when we were when we were preparing the slides, the, my reflections on the API world is that typically what seems to happen in in a corporation is like uh, okay there 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 seems to be an inflation of APIs, so that means that probably you have high autonomy, right? And then but then there is uh, in some cases they are not that reliable, so then they cannot be reused. And then it's a way of isolating, self-isolating a team because then they can expose the constrained, constrained version of whatever they have, data or so, or services. Um, and then what's next, right? So then sometimes APIs, I have the feeling, and please don't kill me because of saying this, is, is like a way of uh, self-isolating, leave me alone, I can, I, I, can, I can keep working on my stuff, I don't care about giving you the service, but I need to expose this API because I've been asked to do this. And, and that's basically poor performance at the end of the journey. So um, with, with the next slide, what, what we are trying to, to show here is a, uh, this, this discussion right on, on, on the basics of, of inner source. And, and we've been discussing around, you know, more or less the same principles. I really love this discussion about reuse versus um, autonomy. That seems to be like, you know, contradictory sometimes in, in a company. But uh, at the end, if we are able to reach the benefits of both at the end, uh, at, the, at the same time, uh, that's probably a win-win for, for everyone. Um, so the, 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 there is this concept around flying around of the polarity management. Okay, how, how can we deal with two concepts or two positions that seems to be like two ones against the other, but then perhaps with inner source and seems to be, uh, there is a path to bring both together and say, okay, there is a path to, to give people autonomy, but leaving others to influence your roadmap, to, 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 to give others the opportunity to be part of your of your development process and have that discussion with you, bring others to bring those uh, you know needs, requirements, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So this list of principles, these are not mine. This this is the usual presentation by Jim Jack from from Apache Software Foundation um, that that used to give a few years ago on when introducing inner source. So this is a cultural change, right? Um, and th there is a journey on all of this. So first of all, it's about opening communication. So being having any kind of communication all around the organization, or at least in the projects that, that are part of the inner source initiative, openly communicated. So then what we are bringing to others is basically transparency, right? And then with this transparency, because we are human beings, we have opinions. So at some point we'll discover that there are other experts in certain technologies. You'll be able to reach other people that, that may have this, uh, you know, they are simply, uh, great at the kind of things that they are doing, it happens that you didn't, you didn't know them. So by, by opening these communication channels and bringing this transparency, so we will bring together, you know, like a group of people that they have similar interests. So then in somehow we are, we are creating a community. Um, by meritocracy, even if uh, this word may come from, from the open source world, but may not be the right word, but in any case, you understand the concept. Uh, meritocracy, what they mean is basically we'll, we'll, we'll start seeing if we have this community of practitioners or, or internal developers or, or, or managers discussing and working on, on certain concepts, we'll see that suddenly there will be, you know, uh, technical leaders that will lead a certain discussions and then those will be at some point part of this trusted committer group of people. The concept of trusted committer for those that are new to this are those that are, you know, kind of the usual committers in open source, but in a, in a corporation, they are trusted by management. So then they can have that conversation with them, asking for, you know, budget, time, etc. And then they are able to have this conversation with developers as well. So they can bring together, they can bridge um, the discussion by uh, between both worlds. So these are the inner source principles. Uh, now I wanted to, to share with you a couple of slides on 
um, coming from, from the surveys that we are running at the Inner Source Commons. So first of all is this one. So when I think of Inner Source, I think of. Um, and the, the most, uh, the, the answers with the highest uh, percentage, uh, of course, here you can see that you can answer more than once. Uh, it's about, okay, if, if I if I want to apply Inner Source, or when I think of Inner Source, I think of reusing software, which is the, the second one, uh, contributions from members, not not in my team. So I'm, I'm mentioning some of the ones that are relevant for the conversation today. today. Uh, contribution, uh, contributing to projects within the organization that uh, my team rely on, but I'm perhaps not formally involved in. So it's about, you know, having this reusability and autonomy bringing to the, to the discussion. And perhaps uh, contributing to projects that I have a personal interest or connecting to other people even, right? If we move to the next slide, um, what we can see is a different view. Is inner source has, has helped me and my team in the following ways. So the first one is when I think of inner source, this is these are the benefits. When I have applied inner source, these are the benefits. So the first, the first of all, with a really big gap, is shared knowledge. So uh, and because we are sharing knowledge, we are breaking down the silos. So ideally, this is a this concept or this this problem with autonomy in the API world in this case is may disappear because we are able to discuss with others and sharing the knowledge that we have perhaps by simply sharing uh, requirements or or other other things get to know more people increase my enjoyment well this is engagement in the uh, within the company um, or the corporate culture identify new features and then you are bringing these these new ideas. Um, to the to the new API, uh, you know, inner source team improve the quality of the software, so then you are able to increase the reliability of the API service. So all of them are in somehow related to the discussion that, that we are we are having uh, today between between APIs. So now with all of these concepts, we wanted to go into the use cases. Uh, so George is now your <laughs> your turn. Um, what what we would like to to share with you are three examples. And go through them in in this. Uh, probably for for the next step of the talk, and I mean the the hour together, would be great if you can reflect on this or you have some thoughts and ideas that you would like to share. So feel free to use the chat for for this. George, all yours. Yeah, thanks, Daniel. And, and this is you know like Daniel was saying about you know uh, same language has been used in, in all, almost in, in both kind of communities yeah. and. And when we start to, to learn more and more about how inner source can be applied, I think every company and every culture is unique and probably be in a in a starting a different starting point than other companies and maybe require a different type of, of investment uh, or different types of um, I was I say you know solving different problems for for uh, at some point. So those are kind of you know from from our experience. Uh, some common use cases that we have to solve for, and we, this is the way we, we, we look at it today from those three buckets, uh, inner sourcing the content, inner sourcing the standard, and then inner sourcing the code. This is what are we are inner sourcing. This is a kind of a view of point of view where um, we look at what is being inner sourced, what, what's the artifact has been managed here, right? Um, and let me let's start maybe with the, the the third one first because that's maybe the, the most obvious one or more common one uh inner sourcing the code and uh, uh, here this tackles within that bucket there are three different use cases if you will right based on what kind of problem we try to solve so the first one was the uh common libraries a shared common libraries I discovered we, we we had an SDK or the library for APIs to consistently apply security to all APIs uh, across platforms and across. So we have one universal security model across uh, technology stacks. And so we needed this uh, common library for all teams, consumers and providers of APIs to, to use. As you could imagine, this is needs a lot of scale, a lot of technology stacks, you know, Java.net, uh, uh, Node.js. Uh, we, we even do have mainframe uh, applications, APIs also. So, uh, and there's no one team who can scale and have all the skill sets, right? So we resorted to uh, uh, a flavor of inner sourcing where 
uh, there's centralized requirements, but the the, the actual contributions uh, could come from those teams who have those skill sets to build those requirements uh, for their own platform. Uh, so that's that was one one use case. The other one was more of a DevOps with the enterprise CI/CD, uh, a common pipeline to go to production or to promote um, from one environment to a higher environment. So that was another one. So the choice of what product or what uh, library to um, to inner source or to apply this investment of inner sourcing would be based on what what kind of you know some of the culture and, and the, the the problem is trying to solve. Another one was the product features. So we do have API management as their own products, right? We have a product area with product teams. Um, and uh, they open up the API linting rules. The API linting is, is kind of uh, a concept within the API that's uh, open for security, for architect, for DevOps teams to contribute those naming conventions. So when I'm designing my API, I would run through those policies or conventions before it gets approved or before it gets, you know, you, as a developer, you get instant feedback, whether this is a, a, a good design or not, you know, very quickly from a design governance perspective. So, and you could receive those um, automated rules and policies from multiple disciplines, you know, from security, from architects, or from DevOps naming convention or server convention, all that kind of stuff within the naming of, of the interface. So that's uh, securing the code, which is kind of common. Now we move into the secure in, inner sourcing the, the standard, which is a little bit kind of uh, out of the box, kind of from inner sourcing perspective, because now we're not dealing with code, but dealing with uh, patterns. And, and tools and best practices, what we call standard, small as standards. Uh, for a community driven, anyone in the community could propose and we could uh, shine the light on what's happening in the community uh, and promote that through the API Guild, uh, uh, many working groups within the Guild to promote those solutions as enterprise patterns or enterprise adoption. Uh, and that's how we can deal with that scale of API governance. Uh, and the uh, uh, obsolete knowledge of a smaller group or or or, or the bandwidth uh, issue or all those policies that we talked about, when you start having those working group within uh, the community to uh, shorten the adoption cycle and to propose the right tools and 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 there is the trusted committers or the the architects who can uh, get those ideas and formalize them and and Put them back for the community. Uh, so this is kind of driving the requirement to update all our standards and conventions and, and patterns and, and tools. And finally, you know, a, a, a low hanging fruit kind of inner sourcing uh, for content. Uh, we're sharing the contribution. So we do have a Discover Technology Academy is a content management system that's uh, uh, mainly we have our APIs the plan to have more social features and collaboration on the API so people can contribute knowledge and can contribute uh, business cases, uh, having conversation in the context of, of, of an API of a product. Um, and, and some of the example that just emerged there that some teams used to have like a, a, a auto config script for our API that has our, this SD. So, they shared that on uh, the Discover Technology Academy and other folks start to reuse that. Other teams, they found it helpful and that knowledge started to spread and became, you know, some a green, uh, a grassroot kind of support that grassroot learning and uh, and sharing and of knowledge and persistent and contextual knowledge. Uh, so with that, those are, you know, very high, as I said, it's kind of, uh, uh, Many ideas here and there that's helped, uh, and I'm sure everybody's um, experience would be a little bit unique. Or, or those are common patterns that's love to share and love to go deeper in the, in the Q and A. Uh, if you. Would.